Well, there is a verse in the Bible I want to share with you that's going to kind of anchor our time in this new series. This new series that we're doing is about our purpose. And it's really important that you understand why we do what we do as a church. Certainly, we praise God for our worship team. Wasn't our worship so spectacular this morning? If you had a chance to uh, be here yesterday, we had authentic brotherhood and sisterhood. Pray that you had a great time. I uh, heard the authentic sisterhood uh, speaker was just so fine. She's just so beautiful. Uh, and uh, our growth groups, hopefully you've signed up for those. And hopefully you've been impacted by the sermons that we preach. But it is very easy because church is essentially a market. You choose a church and you figure out which one you want to go to. And it's very easy to slip into the idea that our music is just meant to inspire you and our teaching is meant to just inform you and our programs are just meant to get you involved. And we want to do all those things. We want you to feel involved and informed and inspired. But I believe this verse in Galatians chapter 4 really anchors why we do what we do and why I do what I do as a pastor. And it's so important every now and then, think about why. Why did you walk in here? Why did you get through the rain? Why are you sitting here listening? Why do you go to those programs? Why do you join a group? Every now and then we've got to just sit and ask ourselves, why do we do what we do? In Galatians chapter four, verse 19, I think really anchors why we do what we do. In Galatians 4, 19, it says it like this. My little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. The way that the Apostle Paul pictures this is that he's like a parent and he's acting as if he is in labor. But his desire, his anguish is that I am just praying that you would look more like Jesus from the inside out. That's Paul's highest aim. And it is for us as well, that more than anything else that we're trying to do, if we're trying to get you in a group, if we're trying to get you involved in a, in a Saturday meeting with the women or men, if we preach, we are wanting to see Christ formed in you. And we want to see you look more like Jesus. And the phrase that we could use for that is spiritual formation. That's why we do what we do. Everything we do is about getting you to look more like Jesus. And other churches may do things differently, but our goal above anything else is that you would more, look more like Jesus. And so this series that we are in for these next three weeks is really going to touch on the purpose and the mission of our church. Our mission and our purpose, if you've been here for a while, you've heard us say we want to reach people where they are and help them grow. And that means that wherever you're at spiritually on the map today, it's our desire to help you grow spiritually. And what we've said last year, and we always need to kind of come back to this, is that we generally reach four types of people. We reach transplants, wanderers, slide backers, and foreigners. When we say transplants, we mean that many of you came from another city, another country, another borough, and you were at a good church, and now you're coming to what you consider another good church. You, you went from a good situation, and you want to be in a good situation. Some of you, though, are wanderers, and you just came out of like a nightmare kind of situation, and you're just, you're here, and you're listening, and you're not all in yet. You're kind of like, I don't know. I don't know if the pastor is really genuine. Would y'all just talk about money? Y'all want my money? I don't know. And you're kind of trying to figure things out, and you're kind of wandering through and you're a little suspicious, and you've been checking out different churches, and you're trying to see if this is a good fit for you. And then thirdly, there are slide backers. Now, some of you, you, you grew up in the house of the Lord, your, your daddy was a deacon, your mama was over Christian education, you, you, you were in vacation Bible school, you did all the things, then you went to college, and you did everything you were big and bad enough to do, and you backslid, and then you found out life is hard without Jesus, mama and daddy were right, and so you're de deciding to slide back into the house of the Lord, and we welcome you slide backers, we love you in the mighty name of Jesus. And our fourth and yet smallest group of people are foreigners. Now we don't mean ethnically or nationally, 
We mean foreign to the things of God. You did not grow up in the house of the Lord. You did not grow up knowing who David was. You did not know who the apostle Paul was. The Bible wasn't something sitting around in your home. And so because of that, this is still new to you. And this is a group of people that we long to reach, but they are the hardest group to reach. And so because of that, because our purpose is to reach people wherever they are, we have to be honest with ourselves. Many churches can structure themselves around just reaching church kids who've grown up. And one of the things that means is if your goal is just to reach church kids who are sliding back in, wandering, and transplanting, it means we're depending on the prayers of your mom and dad. We're depending on the former discipleship that you've been a part of, the former formation that you've been a part of. And I don't know if you know this, but the country, the culture, and the city are less open to the things of God than ever before. And if we are depending on your grandmama's prayers to see people walk in that door, in 20 years, this place will be empty. We cannot depend on spiritual legacy as the primary means of church growth. What we must do as a church is fix our minds and our hearts on reaching all types of people, but if we are gonna reach people who are foreign to the things of God, then we must structure ourselves and repurpose the way that we think. And so as a leadership team, we got away and we really evaluated our purpose statement. And we felt that yes, we wanna reach people where they are and help them grow, but you know, grow to do what? What is the end game? And we really felt like the end game needs to be more explicit. Because if we grow, if we just say grow, sometimes that can be presumed that our job of growth is just to make you feel a warm Christian environment with Christian content. And that you come in and you're like, I like this series, let's do a new series. I like this book, well, let's do a new book. I like this group, I need a new group. And all of a sudden, we're trying to keep you by having greater content. But growth can't be about keeping you. Growth has got to be about sending you. <laughs> growth has got to be about getting you. Gro growth can't be about you knowing more about the book of Ecclesiastes, you knowing more about the book of Deuteronomy. We cannot keep informing you or giving you a better experience. We'll try. We want the air condition to work better in here, praise God. We do. <laughs> we really do. We, we want our programs to be as great as they can. We really do. But we cannot define our growth simply by saying everyone in here is having a good time with one another while the world goes to hell. We've got to repurpose our thinking to think about out there and how to get out there in here. So what we decided was, well, when we say grow, we're not saying the whole story. So we have changed our purpose statement. I know y'all are wanting to ex be excited about that. But we just, we just had to clearly define what we were trying to do. So we said we want to reach people where they are and help them grow so they can impact the city for Jesus. Okay. That's the goal. That's the goal. That's the goal. You, 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 you all are teachers and lawyers and doctors and some of you all are or your actors or, or your actor barista, praise God. Whatever, whatever God's doing, whatever the Lord is doing in your life, right? But, right? But, 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 but the goal is not just to ask God to get you a better career. The goal is God equip me when I'm in that career so that people can see Jesus in me. And if, and if we're doing anything else, then we're just kind of a social uh, group, a network. We're, we're like a Christian network to find friends. And we want to be an equipping station. So we don't want to just meet Christians. We want to reach people. And so those, those, those three words are going to be something that we are going to continue to pound more, reach grow, impact. Would you say that with me? Reach, grow, impact. One more time. Reach, grow, impact. And throughout this series, 
we're going to talk about ways that we are trying to structure ourselves to reach people better, to grow people more effectively, and to impact the city more effectively. Shameless plug here, we are going to talk about impacting the city, but many of you may, may know that we have an organization that fights against racial injustice. It's called Pray March Act, and we have an upcoming event, and I would love us to flood that event. I want us to be able to really come out to that event. That is, uh, we do, uh, Pray March Act does a, does a, uh, a, a gathering called the Redirect, and it is intended to get our minds off of national news and get us into local news. But it's also to get our minds off of earthly, um, earthly solutions and think about heavenly solutions. In other words, we can't just depend on politicians to change this country and to change the city. We've got to start being the kind of people that, have, that can impact the city through our prayers, but not just praying, but in being involved in the situation. So we have a migrant crisis, y'all in this city, if you're not informed about that, from my last count, we, I believe we have about 10,000 new migrants coming into the city every single month. And so that's causing a lot of tension in the city. And so we wanna come talk about ways that the church can get involved in that and ways that we can pray about that. So that will be happening September 29th. Um, if you want to, if you wanna get involved in that or you wanna be a part of that, we'd love for you to RSVP. You can go to the Bridge Church app and you can RSVP there, it'll be 7 p.m. It is in Harlem. We're not always able to get this building, um, but that is in Harlem, September 29th. Amen? Pray you come out to that. But today we wanna talk about reaching. We wanna, we, 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 we have the anguish of childbirth, like Paul, to see Christ formed in you, and the kind of person that we want you to be is the kind of people that reaches people that loves people. Paul the Apostle had a similar heartbeat and he talks about how he's trying to get the people of God to see everything eternally, to see people around them with an eternal perspective. And in 2 Corinthians, that's kind of the heartbeat of the message. He's trying to get them to see everything in light of eternity, to not just focus on the temporal things but also focus on eternal things and when we get to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, this is what Paul the Apostle says in verse 10 and 11. He says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. Notice here that Paul the Apostle brings up the judgment seat of Christ. Now, when the, when the Bible is talking about the judgment seat for believers, that has to do with our works, the things we've done in the body. But when we talk about the judgment seat overall, he is talking about the fact that there is a fear that we have if we have to stand in front of the Lord and have him evaluate our lives. And the word there, he says, think about the judgment seat of Christ and think about the fear that it produces. Some of you all understand that when you're in front of someone who you think has a higher righteousness, a life that is just transcendent, you begin to feel something about your own life. The word here, fear, could be translated as terror. And so what he says is, we know the fear of the Lord, the terror of the Lord. We know the holiness of God. And because of that, we feel persuaded to persuade others to know God personally. The Bible here, Paul is attempting to get them to think about what God has done for them. And here's what Paul believes. If you know what God has done for you, you will feel compelled to tell others about it. If you don't know the fear of the Lord, you won't persuade nobody. But if you know what God has done, you will feel compelled. At the end of this chapter, he says in one sentence, essentially what God has done for us. He says, for our sake, in verse 21, for our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin so that 
in him we might become the righteousness of God. This verse captures what God has done for us, and it captures how we have been treated in a way we should not deserve. But it also pictures Jesus being treated in a way that he did not deserve. Think of the imagery in regards to treatment. Look what he says, for our sake he made him to be sin. But this is the key, he knew no sin. Sinless Jesus stood in the place of sinful James. And he got treated with the treatment that I deserved, knowing he deserved the treatment of a sinless person. The gospel is good news if I stop right there. That when I look on the cross, I think to myself, I deserve that treatment. Now, if you think the cross was nice, then you will not fully understand what he's done for you. But if you know that I deserved what he got, then you will feel the depth of mercy and grace that's been afforded for you. So he says, Jesus, the sinless one, stood in the place of sinners like me and you. That is worthy of praise. It's worthy of honor. It makes us want to shout. But that's only half the story. Because the Bible goes on to say that not only was Jesus treated like a sinner, though he had not sinned, but the Bible says so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That means that we get credited with the righteousness of Christ, and therefore we, eternally speaking, are no longer considered sin-bearing because Christ has died for our sins. Another way of putting that is, he stood in my place as a sinner, but I get to stand in his place as a righteous person. So one author put it this way, as Christ has not made was not made sin by any sin inherent in him, so neither are we made righteous by any righteousness inherent in us. But the righteousness of Christ has been imputed to us. That word imputed means given to us. So when I gave my life to Christ, I gave him my sin. But when I gave him my sin, he gave me his spirit. And when that happened, we did this great exchange. You take my life, I'll take your life. You didn't deserve that, but I don't deserve this. And if you don't understand the great exchange, then you will never understand the persuasion we're called to have with people before us. So the gospel says we've had this great exchange. Jesus was treated like someone who had done wrong while never doing wrong. Every kid has a moment where they dream of what it would be like someone for a day. You ever do that when you were a kid? Shoot, we do that as adults, amen, right? I wonder what it would be like Beyonce, just one day, just, you know what I'm saying, just up there, not all the bad stuff, but just the good stuff, you know what I mean? What it would be like just to walk around and people be like, God, you know, what's it like just, just to feel fame? What's it like to be LeBron James, just to walk someplace and people just be amazed? Just, couldn't it be amazing if I just felt that honor and amazement, right? And, 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 and you, your mind could go on and on for days about people you'd like to experience the life that they have. Anytime we think about being someone for a day, it's always a life up. It's never a life down. None of us would say, man, I'd like to be treated like a prisoner on death row. And yet the righteous one decided to be treated like an unrighteous one. And even if we said, I'd like to take a step down, we'd always say, I'm coming back. I'll, take the, I'll do this for a day. I'm going to take my place back there because I like this life. And yet Jesus is treated like a sinner, and we get treated with righteousness. And we now have righteousness carrying us all the days of our life. And his sin covers us. His his. His righteousness covers us all the days of our life. That is what we call, saints, good news. And the good news of the gospel 
is what should compel the way that we see ourselves and see our lives. And so because of this great exchange, what does Paul encourage them to do? He says, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, knowing the judgment of God, knowing that God is not going to turn a blind eye to our sins, but knowing our sins were taken care of on the cross. If we know that, then the way that this is rendered is, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. That word persuade means we talk to people. Now, I know the gospel is something that we want to just emanate from our lives. But this persuasion, he literally says, it's we address people. We tell people. And if we tell people, if we know the goodness and the mercy of God, then we don't have to be the kind of people that wear t-shirts that constantly say, I'm blessed. You don't have to change every conversation into a gospel conversation. You don't have to make people afraid, but you cannot assume that people living outside the grace and the mercy of God will be okay. We cannot live with a you do you mentality when we know what God has done for us. So he says, in light of the fear of the Lord, we persuade people. And persuasion means that I want something for you, and if I can get you to do it, I'll have you do it. I took some people out one time to eat. They found out I was a pastor. And you know, you always have a person that's just like, you just, you just trying to get us to go to church. Yes! <laughs> Is this? Yes, I am. And if I had a favorite restaurant, I'd be trying to get you to that. And if I had a favorite movie, I'd be like, yo, we got to go check out this movie. And if I had a favorite person, I'd be like, I want you to meet that person. Anything I've been persuaded by, I want you to be persuaded by. Have you, have you, have you ever watched a movie that you were into and you show it to a friend and they're not into it? You're like, you got to see this part. You got to see this part. Stop texting, you're gonna miss it, you're gonna miss it. <laughs> and all I'm saying is we don't have to conjure something up, we just gotta get, we have to fall in love with the gospel. You, I don't need to persuade you about a movie, I just need to watch the movie again, I need to see it again. I don't need to persuade you about a restaurant, I just need to go eat there again. And the more that I do that, the more I tell you, ooh, I just came from my favorite place. I don't need you to do what I do, that's called proselytization. I don't need to try to hijack your life and, do, and be my life. I just, but I just want you to know I'm experiencing something so good, I wish you could experience it. I wish you could have what I had. Oh, if you know what I had, he took my place. And I've been treated, listen, the, the old folks used to say, he's treated me better than I treat myself. And that's the gospel. And until we get to that place where we realize I've been treated so good that I... I would love for you to experience what I experienced. Y'all, I'm trying to see y'all talk to people. I want you to be the kind of person that reaches people, that sees people in light of eternity. And Paul, he's trying to get them out of the temporal world and trying to get their eyes fixed on eternal things. And throughout this, throughout this book, that's what he's been trying to do, get people to see everything eternally. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17 and 18, look what he says. Before this, he says, for this light momentary affliction, these are people being persecuted, there are people being killed, he called it a light momentary affliction, is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comp uh, comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. He's trying to get them to see their trials in light of eternity. Then he says, uh, for we know that if this tent that our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God. He's trying to get them to see death in light of eternity. Then he says, for we walk by faith, not by sight. He's trying to get them to see everything 
eternally. And so because he's been building up this idea of getting them to see things eternal and not just temporal, if you see trials eternally, if you see death eternally, if you see your faith eternally, then we got to start seeing people eternally. We got to start seeing people as either in the kingdom of God or separated from God. We must see everything eternally, but we must see everyone eternally. A while back, as pastors, we were dealing with a situation and there was a person that, I tell you, they, they just started working on me, praise God. They started, they started getting on that nerve and they just know, they just knew that nerve and they just started working my nerve, praise God. And I was just finding myself about to jump out of myself and I was getting frustrated and I had things I wanted to say and I got, I got a person on the inside like, I know how to handle it. And I'm like, no, stay inside. And I felt these feelings. <laughs> Leroy, I call him Leroy. Um, <laughs> Leroy was like, let me out. And what, and listen, and, and it was just, it was just a small conversation. Pastor Russell said, well, yeah, I know, and I was like, and then he did this, and then he did that, and then he did this, and then he did that, and then he did this, and how are you going to do that? And I can't believe they did that. And, I did, and then all of a sudden he said, well, man, we got to remember that this person doesn't even know the Lord. And I was, and it like took me out my trance. And it detached me from seeing him just in the flesh. And what Paul is trying to get you to be the kind of person is to see neighbors not in the flesh but to see them in light of eternity. In fact, I think you got somebody working your nerve right now too. It might be a person in your family, it might be somebody on your job, it might be somebody who's disappointed you. Now, obviously there are Christians that can work our nerves, amen, but that's not this sermon today. <laughs> but I want you to think just for a second, from now on we don't regard that person in the flesh. There is a name that you can fill in the blank there. We don't regard this person in the flesh anymore. And I know that you're not there yet, praise God. It's okay, it's all right. Let's, just, let's allow this moment to just be here. You're not there yet. You don't see everything and everyone eternally, but that's our goal is to transform you into the kind of person that sees everyone eternally. Because if you see them eternally, you'll start to pray for them. And you'll start to persuade them with the goodness and mercy of God, even though they don't care for you, even though they may want to hurt you, even though they may even want to crucify you. But if you love people while they try to crucify you, you might just be like Jesus who said on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he said it while they were killing him. And so this morning, the gospel has an implication of persuasion. It has an implication of seeing people differently. And it has that implication because we've been caught up in the great exchange over our lives. And so Paul says, if you know about the kingdom of God, and you know you've been added to the kingdom of God, not based upon what you do, but based upon what God did, then we change how we see ourselves. And in verse 20, he says it this way, therefore we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Understand that the word appeal here, it, it means to address, it means to come alongside. The word implore here means to beg, desperately beg. And so if you want to read this accurately, it is saying Jesus is begging people to come to himself and he is using us. In other words, if you look at what he said about persuasion and imploring and addressing, Jesus is persuading, appealing, begging people to be in a relationship with him through us. And we have been chosen 
to be his persuasive tool on earth. Now, Jesus and I are different because I struggle with delegation now as a person, much less saying the way that I want to impact the world is by transforming broken humans to be like me. But God says that we would have greater works and more places would be impacted if I impart my spirit into them and then I could be in courtrooms and I could be in neighborhoods and I could spread the glory of God all throughout if I impart my spirit to all these people. And so a spirit-filled Christian is God's persuasive tool on earth. And so therefore we are ambassadors for Christ, people of another nation who are now trying to persuade people of a different nation about the message of the king. And the ambassador would come into a town and they would announce what the king desires. And they know that they're not going in their own name, they're going in the name of a nation. So what is our goal as a church? We want people to come in as a foreigner to Christ, but to walk out as an ambassador for Christ. That's the goal. We want to see people who, who didn't know Jesus, know Jesus, and then get other people to know Jesus. That's our goal. And that's what we're trying to shape you to be. And so one of the things that we are going to be introducing um, is a, what we call a foundations class. It will be a five-week class, and it is primarily for people who are getting baptized. We believe that baptism, when you get baptized, that is one of the most unique moments to tell the world you know Jesus now. And we believe we want to do a better job of preparing people for baptism by getting them to know their testimony and know the basics of the faith. So if you have come to the altar, you will be getting a text message or an email about our foundations class. And we are wanting to flood that foundations class with people who have come up to the altar, but also people who want to become, you, didn't, you may have not been knowing God, but we want you to not only know God, but we want you to tell other people about Jesus. Anyone that comes to the altar will then start to go through these classes. Again, you will learn about the basics of the faith and you will also learn how to communicate your testimony. When you start coming to know Jesus and you're coming out of the world, we do not want you to reject all your old friends. We want you to reach your friends. So we want to equip you to reach people. We feel like but one of the things that happens is when you come to Christ, sometimes you now make Christians your only friendships. And we talked about this yesterday that we, we're not saying that we want you to remove all your friends, but we do want you to distance yourself from people that may be persuading you away from the things of God. But we do want you to still persuade people, appeal to people, and implore people because we want you to come in as an ambassador, or we want you to come in as a foreigner, but we want you to leave as an ambassador. We have a family here today that we think is a great picture of that. Could we have Jonathan and Jessica, or just Jonathan's gonna come up. Jonathan, Han, come on up. Could you give it up for Jonathan? And Jonathan is a missionary. Jonathan, tell them a little bit of your story. Where did you grow up and, and how did you become a Christian? Well, thanks for having us here this morning. Jessica grew up in Kansas. That's where she came to faith. But I was born and raised in Sunset Park, child of immigrant parents. You know, my dad worked in a restaurant. My mom worked in a garment factory. Grandma took care of us when they were at work. Um, but I grew up with a lot of spiritual influences in my life. My parents were involved with ancestor worship. We had an altar in our home but then they sent us to Catholic schools, but then my aunt, who was the only Christian in our family, would take me to VBS. So I grew up hearing Bible stories. I grew up singing the songs. I grew up maybe playing the part of a Christian, 
but really wasn't until my freshman year at Syracuse where someone not only shared the gospel with me, but challenged me to respond to this good news. What was I gonna do about what I just heard? So actually this Wednesday will be 20 years since I became a Christian. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like You eventually became a missionary, right? So tell us about Mm -hmm. your missionary journey, and and, uh, we know that COVID affected your missionary Mm -hmm. journey, so tell us a little bit about your preparation becoming a missionary and what happened during COVID. (laughs) So so last time we worshiped here at Bridge Church was five years ago. You know, we were getting ready to head to China, and see, for 10 years prior to that point, Jessica and I, we've been praying, we've been dreaming, we've been strategizing, orienting our lives here, so we can spend the rest of our lives there. Even after we left Bridge Church, we still had a year of studying Chinese to do. So it wasn't really until 2019 where we got made it to our city. This was the same city that Jessica had visited multiple times on mission trips in college, where God had planted a seed in her heart to return many years later. So it became our home, you know? And I definitely want to acknowledge that COVID was a difficult season for all of us. Difficult for many of the pastors as they yeah. try to navigate ministry in a pandemic. For us, we were only in China for a year and a half. Wow. We were in our city for six months when Jessica and I first heard about rumors of a mysterious virus in a city two hours north of us in Wuhan. I remember getting a text message that was pumped out by the Chinese government to every phone in China at 4 a.m. saying that the city of Wuhan, city of 11 million, would be shut down in four hours. Mm. I mean, 8 a.m., no one in, no one out for 76 straight days. Mm. We remember visiting friends in another part of China and we arrived at their place and we would like took off our masks, took off our gloves, we took hot showers, we washed all our clothes because we didn't know how the virus spread at the time. We also remember being told by our leadership to evacuate within 48 hours. Hmm. So Jessica and I left this beautiful land that we called home. Uh, we couldn't go back to our city, we couldn't close up our apartment, we couldn't say goodbye to any of our friends. We left with two carry-on suitcases and haven't been able to return since. Wow. But, you know, we've had a lot of, a few years to, to think about this. And despite the personal losses, the grief, yeah. the unknowns, the instability, having to move six times over the last five years, we believe, we still believe, hmm. Jesus is still worth any sacrifice we can wow. make to get the Amen. gospel to any as many people in our lifetime. Lastly, why don't you mm-hmm. tell them now, my understanding is you prepared 10 years yes. for a mission field mm-hmm. that you had to leave after four months. Yeah, six months. Yeah, Six yeah, months. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So now where is your mission field now? Well, we'll be here in the States until the Christmas holidays, after which we'll go back to Southeast Asia. We're headed to a new assignment. It's an up and coming country. 65% of populations under the age of 35. So it's a very young country, very creative, very entrepreneurial. They love to laugh, love to joke, curious about the world. But it's, it's not going to be easy. It's hard ground for the gospel. So that's why we need faithful believers like you, faithful churches like Bridge, who are already reaching people across the street to come join us to reach people across the world. Amen. So. Amen. Amen. And so one of the things I just want them to... Amen. Amen. One of the things that I want them to make sure that they understand... In that preparation of 10 years mm-hmm. of learning Chinese, yeah. the place you go now, you're going now, they don't speak Chinese. No, they don't. So you're having to learn a whole new language it's, now. It feels like we're starting all over again, yeah. but now with a baby. So that yeah. makes it a little bit <laughs> le- extra harder. Yeah. Yeah. So, mm-hmm. so I, think it's, I think it's amazing because how many of us would prepare for something for 10 years and it not work out, and we'd be like, oh, I guess I need to do something else. Instead, <laughs> after... After 10 years of preparation, he decided, I'm going to go to a different land, learn the language, but stay on mission for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Can you give it up for these two? Thank you. you. Saints, I wonder if you'd stand with me real quick.